Thank you for upholding our covenant and gathering uh, this morning. Uh, announcements. Evening service is tonight from 6 to 7.30. Uh, it's a great way just for us to kind of get a little different uh, service from what we get normally on Sunday in the gathering. Uh, we'll be doing some praying. Um, so, yeah, it's good. I, I encourage you guys to come. Again, it's from 6 to 7.30. Uh, membership class, January 21st and 22nd, which is a Friday and a Saturday. So on Friday, we'll be providing dinner. It's from 6 to 9 on Friday. And then from uh, Saturday, from 9 to 12. <clears throat> so breakfast will be provided. And it's a great way to, to see what we're about, who we're about, uh, what we believe. So if you guys are interested in that, please to uh, echo, uh, echo church, uh, dot slet, dot echo church dot net slash events. Um, and uh, tithing, if we, if you guys have the, uh, the heart to give, um, please guys, we ask uh, that you guys can help us uh, with, with tithing. Uh, it's the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And uh, after all, God has given us everything, right guys? So, uh, we have our box in the back, or you can go uh, online at echochurch.net slash give and give there. Uh, at this time, lovely Nancy will be reading uh, our scripture in New City Catechism. Uh, what is New City Catechism? We practice and read New City Catechism. Uh, being catechized has been around for thousands of years. It's a great way for us to understand uh, good theology and, and have good doctrine. Uh, so if you guys can open up to Judges 2, 1 through 5, and we'll be going over New City Catechism, question number two. All right, I'll be reading the question and we'll answer together. The question is, what is God? And we answer, God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. And let's all stand for the reading of the word. Today we're in Judges 2, 1 through 5. Judges 2, 1 through 5. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Got to turn myself on there. Good morning, Echo Church. Good to be with you guys. This is um, we've we've had a number of our uh, members and attenders, attendees, and and people who have been uh, who have had the Omicron variant of COVID. So we just ask you guys to continue to keep those around you that you know they're aware uh, in prayer. Um, uh, luckily, of the people that we have talked with, symptoms have been pretty mild, but uh, a number of people in our church are uh, affected by that right now. Uh, good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I want to put a real quick plug in for what Randy mentioned, our Sunday evening service. Um, Here's, here's the vision behind Sunday evenings. Sunday mornings, uh, we, we have, you, you guys have been here probably, um, and we, we've, there's a couple of things we do on Sunday mornings. We, uh, we are in the Word. I, I usually preach for about 40 minutes. Some of you say, yeah, you preach a lot longer than that. <laughs> it's supposed to be 40 minutes. Um, and uh, we have about, you know, 15 minutes or so to sing together, right? We, we, we worship through song, and that's usually about 15 minutes. Uh, you'll notice that there's very few times, there's, in fact, there's no time at, in, on a Sunday morning where we pray together as a church. You will be led by prayer, and that's good. We're going to agree in prayer when somebody comes up and prays, but praying together as a, as a, as a gathering here is not something we do on Sunday mornings. 
are those things not important? Well, no, they are important. And so because of that, we can't do everything when we get together. And so one of the things that we, we do is we, we shift the focus on Sunday evenings. And there's a couple different things you'll notice. So for instance, we will pray together on Sunday evenings. We will gather into groups and we will pray. We will ha- spend more time singing together because we believe that there's, there's a, there's a, it's a good thing for God's people to get together and to sing and to not just do that for a little bit, we have time constraints here, but to actually do that for a longer period of time where we have, we truly are thinking about, we're sort of in the spirit of worship uh, together and we have time to do that. Now there is a teaching section, but it's shorter and it's different. Okay. So I will teach tonight. I'm going to teach more on what we, what I would call a theological topic rather than working through a book. Okay, so there's something maybe on my heart or another leader at our church's heart, and we will share that and we'll talk about that together. We'll be in scripture, but it's a little different. And that's shortened, and it really is shortened, down to about 20 minutes. Okay, so that's what happens on a Sunday night. I just want to invite you to come. Come and check it out. Um, come even tonight and check it out. It, it, it starts at 6 p.m. and we go for about an hour and a half. And it's, so it's not a huge long service, but it's prayer. It's a little bit of time in the Word together. It's singing together. Uh, so I would love for you guys to come check that out. Okay. That being said, let's continue our study in Judges this morning. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump in. Lord, we ask, as we always do, as I always do, coming up here for your presence in our midst. Here it is, your church, Echo Church, you're gathered together on your day, the day we've set aside in the week to worship you. And now we don't want to be presumptuous and we don't want to think that we can do a service like this somehow as if it could be done without you. But instead we want to invite you and ask you to come and to meet us because We say again what we should be saying every moment of our lives. We cannot do this life alone. And we certainly can't preach alone. And we certainly can't listen to a sermon alone. God, we need you. So come, come Holy Spirit, convict. It's a hard sermon. I pray you'd bring comfort where comfort is needed this morning. Meet us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last night... I was watching Netflix and I don't, I I don't often do this. I I just happened to be, the kids were in bed. I had spent the day watching the kids. Lauren was in San Diego and I was just vegging, you know, and I turned on Netflix and I found a documentary. Some of you may have seen this called the Alpinist. Have you, have you guys heard of this documentary? Okay. This documentary is about a guy who basically free solos, the hardest mountains in the world, okay? So this guy climbs by himself without a rope, a lot of them, not, not all of them, but a lot of them. He will climb without a rope by himself the, the hardest places in the world to climb. So there's this one point in the, in the documentary where he's climbing in Patagonia, this spiral, this spire-looking thing that is, that is, I mean, it's insane how huge this thing is, and he's climbing it by himself in the wintertime without a rope. This guy is, I mean, he should be clinically insane. He should be put away. And his family and friends, when they're interviewed in the documentary, they know this about him. They know that every time he decides to do another one of these climbs, it's like it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when he falls because of the dangerous level of the things that he's doing, right? And so he, he but, but he's exhilarated by, the, by, by climbing. He's exhilarated by specifically climbing without a rope and climbing by himself. It's sort of this, for him, it's this spiritual experience that he has. And they make that clear throughout the, the documentary. But everyone else around him knows that this is an incredibly dangerous game that he is playing. An exhilarating game, but a dangerous game. And I was thinking about that, and I had already prepared my sermon for this morning. But I was thinking about that last night, that sin is very similar to that, isn't it? We, if we're honest, as human beings, 
desire sin because let's let's be honest sin has a level of it's it can be exhilarating can't it it doesn't matter what sin you're talking about it could be gossip right telling that telling that other person about that other person that's there's a sense of exhilaration that you can experience in i'm gonna pass on information that that this person doesn't know that makes this other person look bad right how sick are we right that that's That's exhilarating to us. Sin, it doesn't matter what it is. It's exhilarating. The book of Proverbs says what? That bread which is stolen tastes sweeter. Isn't that interesting? If you were to steal a piece of bread, it it somehow is more exhilarating to you to eat it than if you had to bake that bread or make that bread or buy that bread. Okay, so there's something in our hearts that makes it exhilarating. However, every time we go to sin, and this is, isn't this true about sin? It doesn't always produce a bad effect, does it? Have you guys ever sinned and you knew you sinned and you knew there was something, ah, uh, this was wrong, my conscience is affected by this, and yet oh, nothing happened. There was It doesn't seem like there's any bad effect that came from this. It's because for us, sin is a lot like climbing on the side of a crazy mountain where you just got finger grips in and you're, you're holding on and you're exhilarated the whole way. But that fall is, it's a matter. It's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, right? And this is why God warns us so often about sin. And this is why the book of Judges, and here's the deal, guys. The book of Judges, more than any other book in the Bible, I think, shows you the fall of sin. It doesn't tell you so much that, hey, 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 you better not climb on that mountain. You better not get up on there. You better not do that. It shows you what the fall looks like. And that's why we have this graphic stories, which we're going to get into at some point. And sometimes that fall, you guys, and I don't want you to be confused here. I don't mean that the fall after a sin is always, well, you're damned to hell and God is judging you. Listen to this. Sometimes you can repent and you can turn back to the Lord. Sometimes you can after You fall after sin and God forgives you and he loves you and he pours his grace out upon you. But sometimes, in fact, the often the consequences of your sin remain. And that's what this morning is going to be about. This is not a fun one this morning. I got to tell you, not a fun one. It's about the consequences of sin remaining even after the forgiveness of God has, has come upon you. Because that's what we're going to see in our story in the book of Judges today. All right? Here's here's the point. We're We're going to see two parts of the sermon this morning. We're going to see the part where basically every tribe of Israel goes through and the author of Judges is is giving them all a report card. How did they do in in what God had asked them to do? Were they faithful to the Lord or were they unfaithful to the Lord? That's the first part we're going to see. And then the second part we're going to see is God himself in chapter two, the part that we just read, that Nancy just read, God himself is going to speak and declare what he sees about what is going on with the tribes. And that's where we're going to get our main point this morning. It's going to come from chapter two, specifically in verse three. And here's the main point if you're taking notes. Sometimes our failure to obey God leads to life-changing consequences. Sometimes our failure to obey God leads to life-changing consequences. This is going to be a painful and difficult topic, but let's listen to what the Bible tells us. Let's think through this issue very, very clearly. Judges chapter 1, verse 20. Let's, let's jump there in our Bibles. Judges 1.20 it says this, And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now we start our morning with Caleb. 
Those of you that were here last week, we have already heard about Caleb. We already saw the story with him. But for our purposes this morning, let's just, let's just say we're going to start out on a good note. Caleb did the right thing. He obeyed God. He did what he was called to do. God gave him a property, a territory, and Caleb went in and he fought the people in that territory and displaced them. Okay? Good report card, A plus for Caleb. All right? We're starting out with Caleb. However, we quickly move to a not so good report card, right? We move to the people of Benjamin. That's the tribe of Benjamin. They failed to do what God had called them to do. Do you see it? The Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now, remember, that's sin as far as we're concerned. God had said, you must drive out the people from the land. Don't live with them. Don't make treaties with them. Don't make covenants with them. Don't intermarry among them. This is not, that is disobedience. Drive them out. And so we automatically see Benjamin did not do what they were supposed to do. And we move on, right? We move on. Verses 20, 22 to 26, let's read. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord, the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city that we, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and his family go and went to the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz. And this is its name to this day. So now we get this weird story all of a sudden. So we're going through the tribes and now it's the house of Joseph. The reason they're called the house of Joseph is because Joseph actually has two tribes, Okay, there's two tribes that are sort of under Joseph, and these two tribes go up against a town that is that where there's Canaanites living in it. And the story sounds a lot like a story we've had in the book of Joshua, doesn't it? Those of you who were with us or who know the book of Joshua, this story sounds a lot like what? The story of what? Who? Anybody know the story? Who who's what story does this sound like to you? Rahab, right? I'm getting blank stares. This story sounds like Rahab. I'm telling you. I'm telling you it does. <laughs> remember Rahab in Joshua chapter 2? Remember, remember, remember she was a prostitute? Remember she lived in Jericho? This was one of the towns that the people of God were going to come against, right? And the spies go in and they actually are, are in. She probably had some kind of an inn or some kind of place that she ran. And the spies are there inside of Jericho and they're spying out the area. And then the, the, the guards of Jericho come to look for these spies because they hear there are spies in Jericho. And Rahab hides them. You remember this story? And they said, why, why are you doing this for us, right? And she says, because I know, I have heard what your God has done to the, all of these other people along the way. And basically, I'm paraphrasing here, I fear him. I fear your God. And, and, and if you will deal kindly with me and let my family go, right? Let, wait, as you come in. No, I, I'm basically doing this kindness for you. Will you do this for me? And we talked about that at the time, and that, that this kind of bartering with God is not something that we, that we would say to do. Like we wouldn't tell anybody to barter with God. She was an unbeliever who had enough faith to actually say, well, I don't know how this goes. I don't know theologically how your God works, but could he spare me and my family? And we talked about how there's a heart behind that. That was worthy. There was a heart behind that that was good. There was a work of God that had already gone on in her heart. And here we have a story that on the front end, it sounds similar, right? They come to the city. They ask the first person they see, hey, you show us a way into that city and we'll spare you, right? And we're supposed to sort of get a parallel here, except that it's not, it's not really a parallel. It looks like a parallel, right? So why is it not a parallel? There's two major differences here between Rahab and this particular story. And what we're seeing by the differences here is we're seeing how far Israel has fallen. That's really what we're seeing here, okay? So number one, I, I recognize what your God is, who your God is and what your God has done. 
which we're supposed to understand from that, there was a heart that was towards God. She declared what she believed about him and she asked for mercy from him. These are all elements of repentance. These are all elements of turning to God. God, I know who you are. I know what you have done. And I know that you are the judge of all the earth. And I know that I'm, I can come to you and ask for mercy and you will grant it. Is that not part of your story? Is that not part of anyone? And if you're not a Christian here this morning, you need to know that that is part of what it means to come to God. Recognize who he is. Recognize what he has done. Recognize he's the judge of all the earth. And then say, God, is there mercy for me? You will hear a good answer if that's your heart. There is mercy for you. If you come with that heart to God, there is mercy for you. And there was mercy for Rahab. She actually entered God's people. She became part of them. And she received mercy because she was part of God's people. But look at this man. Random guy, as far as we can tell, walking out of the city. They come upon him. The spies come upon him, right? Tell us the way into the city and we'll let you live. That's different, isn't it? That's not, that's not repentance. That's not turning to the Lord. That's, oh, shoot. Okay. You got a sword to my throat. I'm going to tell you. Right? This man had not come into the people of God by faith. Israel was not to make a covenant with him. Remember, remember Deuteronomy 7, 2, we talked about this before. And when the Lord your God gives them, this is the people of the land over to you, and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Now, again, I've talked about this several times in both Joshua and Judges. That lands on us as super harsh. Okay. There's a lot of reasons for that, that I don't have time to go into right now, uh, as far as what God is doing and the particular timing of what God is doing. This is something, tr this is something that's true for this time, but those are God's words and God's words are being disobeyed here by God's people, even though it looks like mercy. See, sometimes we can think what we're doing is mercy compassion, care for another person, but actually it's disobedience. In fact, the world right now is calling for mercy, calling for compassion, calling for understanding, calling for acceptance in a lot of ways that a Christian simply cannot give and stay obedient to the Lord. And my purpose here is not to get into a culture war discussion. However, Christian, know this. As you consider what the world is desiring and demanding, as it becomes harder to even keep your job, to even keep certain aspects of, of your life and your lifestyle, where, where, you have to, where you're standing against the world in those things, Recognize that our first allegiance is to the God of the universe. That obedience to him is what we must do first. Even when the world says, you're being judgmental. You're being a bigot. You're being unmerciful. You're being unkind. It's hard to hear those things. But our first allegiance is to the Lord. So this looks like mercy but in reality, it's disobedience to God. Let's look at Judges 124 one more time. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city and they said to him, please show us the way in the city and we will deal kindly with you. It's interesting that word, we will deal kindly with you, has a lot of meaning in the Hebrew. We will deal kindly with you is the, is the Hebrew word chesed. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that word. If you've been in church maybe and you've heard a preacher talk about the word chesed, chesed is the...
even if you've never heard that word before, covenant. Making a covenant. And chesed is how you treat one another within a covenant. It's sometimes translated loving kindness. It's sometimes translated covenant faithfulness. Whatever it is, however, however we get at it in the English, it's always tied to a covenant. And here the people, the, the, God's people are making a covenant with this particular individual and saying, we will deal kindly according to the covenant with you. So here's Israel making a covenant and promising covenant kindness, chesed, to a person that God has not given that kindness to. Now, if you're outside of Jesus and you're hearing my voice right now and you've not put your trust in him this morning, let me help you understand something about God. I want you to know something about God this morning. And if, there's, if you don't hear anything else I say and you hear this, I, I'm happy. Hear this about God. God is loving you this morning by allowing you to hear the gospel. There's this incredible thing called the gospel. And the gospel is, it's, it's news. It's actually words that can come out of my mouth. Words are essentially a peace offering from God to you. Essentially a peace treaty. They're essentially words that are saying, this is how to come into my kindness. This is how to come into my covenant. I want, I desire the world to come. I long for the world to come and to receive my offering of peace. And so the way in which that comes in our world today is through a human being. It comes through you. If you're members of Echo Church or members of a different church, you have a calling on your life to share this gospel with other people. They are, it's words that come out of your mouth. And God says, I desire that that gospel be spread to the edge of the earth. That every human being would hear these words. Now, now, don't miss it. That is love for God to, to see that the world would receive that gospel. It's love that it's even coming to your ears right now. Now, you might ask, well, okay, so he wants me to hear a message. Is there more? Is there more to, is there more to God's love for me? If I'm outside of the Christian faith, is there more love for me than that? And my answer is this, it depends on what you do with that gospel. Okay? God's love for you is that the gospel go out to you. God's love for you is that words be given to you, words that are true about how to come in and be at peace with him. Now, the love of God in some ways is contingent upon what you do with that gospel. The key to unlocking the door to God's love and blessing in your life is to be in Jesus Christ. If you are outside of Jesus Christ, there is a love that you do not receive from God. If you are inside of Jesus Christ, there is a love that is freely yours, that is flowing over you from God because you're in Jesus. You don't have God's covenant love in your life if you're outside of Jesus Christ. His love to you right now is that you're hearing the gospel. So here's the gospel. You ready? You're not okay with God as you are. That's the first step. Hear the gospel. You're not okay with God as you are. You weren't born okay with God. You're not okay with God as you just live your life, as you go about your life as the way you want to do it and live it your way. That's not okay. We aren't okay as we start out in this life. You are what the Bible calls a sinner. All of us are. A sinner is not okay with God. This is your status as you start life. But God sent his son, Jesus into the world to live as a human. Jesus ultimately was betrayed and murdered 2000 years ago by the people of his day. But his death was much more than death. It was the sacrifice that God required for all of your sin. 
So his death meant that someone else would die for your sin. If you receive that, if you hear that gospel and you say, yeah, I believe that that happened. I believe you are the judge of the earth. I believe your mercy is actually being extended to me. I want it. I want to receive it. And then in that moment, there's this incredible thing happens. I'd almost say magical. That's not the right word. This incredible thing happens where that that death that he died 2,000 years ago, it was as if you died, your, your sins died. And that life that he lived with faithful obedience to God, it's as if that obedience transfers over 2,000 years and becomes yours so that God sees you with perfect obedience and he sees his son as bearing the death that you should have died. That's the gospel. Now, what you do with that how you respond to that gospel affects everything from that point forward. So if you just heard that and you don't yet know Jesus, you were just loved by God that you heard that message. And I pray because I can't make you receive it. I pray you would receive that and experience the full love of God, the full covenant love of God, where his love is poured out on you as his child. But if you remain outside of that, there is no more love for you from God. I know that sounds harsh. That's the truth. His love is the gospel going forth to you. The Israelites were not to make a covenant with a person who had not ever believed in God and act like God is okay with that person. Because when they extend a covenant, what they're saying is you're good with God here. And that individual was not good with God. Not like Rahab was. Rahab was good with God. Let's keep moving. Judges 1, 27 through 33. We now continue to list the different tribes. We see all the different tribes and we get basically one of two things for all of these tribes. I'm not going to read the verses. Here's what we get. We're either told that the tribe could not drive the Canaanites out. Okay. That, that's kind of like the worst version of it. Or we're told that they made the Canaanites their slaves which is not much better, right? But at least they were able to sort of have exert a sort of dominance or control over the land. For some tribes, they couldn't even do that. And in other tribes, they say, okay, we, we can't really drive you entirely out, but we're going to make you our servants and our slaves. So, so th and, and, and that again was disobedience for what God had told them to do. For instance, um, and then we get this, this, this signal from the author here of Judges who's, who's showing us how bad this is getting. Okay, look, let's look at verse 32 together. Judges 1.32. So the Asherites, that's the tribe of Asher. That's the Israelite tribe. Lived among the Canaanites. Who are the Canaanites? The inhabitants of the land. For they did not drive them out. All of a sudden, the author of Judges starts throwing in this thing. He says, the Canaanites, comma, the inhabitants of the land the inhabitants of the land. And he keeps saying this over and over again. Who are the, who are the inhabitants of the land? The Israelites are supposed to be the, the true inhabitants of the land. But the author of Judges is saying, yeah, it's the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. And then we get this story. At the very end of this section in chapter one, we get the story of the worst tribe in all of Israel. That's right. There's a worst tribe in all of Israel. There is a weakest link in Israel. Okay, you may not have known. This is a Bible quiz. Who is the worst tribe? Anybody know? They always come up. In fact, they don't even make it to the end. They're one of the lost tribes because they don't continue to believe in God entirely as a tribe. Anybody know who that is? It's the tribe of Dan. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Tribe of Dan. Poor tribe of Dan. What's up with them? Okay, let's look at this story. 
All we get is one verse right now. Judges 1, 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. Do you see how bad this is getting now? Some of the tribes defeated the Canaanites in their land, but couldn't entirely take them out. So they enslaved them. Some of the tribes couldn't defeat certain aspects of their land, but they basically control their line, their, their land, not the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan gets beat back by the people of the land and they cower up in the hillside. Now, the reason we're being told this is because this becomes a major story in Judges chapter 18. So we're not there yet, but understand that there's a reason that we're told this right now, but this is the worst of the tribes here. This is the F. Everybody else gets a D minus or a, or a, or a D plus. This is like just a straight up F like you didn't even try on your test, right? And Dan's listed last. So we go from Caleb. What have we just been? Where have we just been so far? We've been from Caleb, A plus. You did it. You knocked out all the land that God gave you. You knocked the people out of that land. You're living in that land. Good job. We go from A plus all the way to you didn't even try on your test. Dan. <laughs> all right. Where has all this led so far? Point number one, if you're taking notes, Israel's failure was a result of deep disobedience and unbelief. We talked about this last week. To be brave in battle during this time is to trust and obey the Lord because he told you, go and fight this battle, go and take these people out. That doesn't happen in all of human history. That's happening here in human history. To be weak in battle or cowardly in battle is not just to be a coward. It's to be disobedient and unbelieving of what God has said. So how does God feel about this? We, learn, we turn now to chapter two and we see what God himself says. Now he's going to speak through an angel. But this is what God says about this time period and this failure. Let's look at verses one through three. Judges two, one through three. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, you shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you but they shall become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. Notice verse three again. I want us to put our eyes, especially on verse three. What did God just say there? He says, so now I say, I will not drive them out before you. Do you remember the promise that God gave while the people were in the wilderness about what was coming forward in the future for them, what God was going to do for them when they got to the land? God, God says it multiple times, but I'm going I'm to give the one that God said in Exodus, okay? Here's what God said in Exodus about the people, a few, a few books of the Bible later, when they would actually get into the land. Here's what he said. Exodus 23, verses 31 to 33. Here's what he says. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand. And you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land. It will surely be a snare to you. Now this gets confusing for us, right? Didn't God say he would drive the people out? Isn't? That what we have here in the text? But what does our text say? You have not obeyed my voice, 
So now I say, do you notice the now? Now I say, I will not drive them out before you. Whoa. Did, did God just change his mind? Is he just fickle? Like, I'm in a bad mood today. So I'm, I'm, I'm changing the things that I said, like, like our parents did, or I probably do as a parent a lot. Like when I'm just grumpy, like, I know I said that, but I don't, I don't mean that anymore. <laughs> is, is that what God is doing here? Is he just fickle? Is he just changing his mind on a whim because he just decided to, to do so? He's just, he's angry, right? Is God breaking his promise? The answer is no. The answer is no. When God gives a promise like this in Exodus 23 or in Deuteronomy or wherever you see it happen, because it happened a bunch, God is making a conditional promise. It's conditional. And this is going to be hard for us to hear because God's conditional promises means that, yes, there is an aspect, there is a truth to the fact that there is a, there is a blessing for obedience for God's people. We love grace here. We love free grace from God for all things. However, don't ever let free grace from God usurp or overcome what the Bible says about conditional obedience. Those two things live together. And it's, it's, it's beyond my scope or ability here to show exactly how they live together. Some of it is mystery. Some of it is very complex theology as we get all of our Bible in front of us and we start thinking through how it all works. But here's what you need to know this morning. Conditional obedience for blessing, for being faithful to God sits next to the free grace of God. And they're friends. They're not enemies with each other. And here, amongst God's people, in the Old Testament, is the concept of, if you continue to remain covenantally faithful to me, I will do these things for you. And guess what? There's aspects to our life as Christians today that are just the same. Israel's choices have consequences. Their disobedience led to a, get this now, a different life than the one they could have lived. If Israel had been faithful to God and actually continued what they had done in Joshua, what they started in Joshua, their life would have dramatically looked different than it was about to look now. Do you, do you see that there in the text? We all know this, right? When we read our Bibles, because we, how many of you have ever thought, what if Adam had just never done that? Oh man. What if Adam and Eve had never sinned? You ever thought about that? What would life be like for us? It would be, I'll just tell you this. It'd be dramatically different than the life we live right now. And I'm not saying, I'm not getting into God's sovereignty here. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that God sits back and just sits there and decides, I don't know the future. You figure out, you know, you let me know what you want to do. That's not God. That's not our sovereign God at all. However, it's still true that God offers these things, blessing and disobedience, a blessing for obedience, curses for disobedience. And he says, you choose. He still does that in the Bible. And here he did it to his people. And his people chose to disobey him. And God says, now, I, I told you before that I was going to drive out all the people. Now I'm not. Now all of these people are going to be with you. Oh, we could have, we could have lived free from the Canaanites in our land, but now, now we can't. You guys remember when the people sent the spies in to check out the land of Canaan? They were wandering in the wilderness. They sent the spies in. Remember, 10 of the spies came back going, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. They're way bigger. And the two, only two spies said, no, guys, our God is bigger than giants. Our God is bigger than the people of the land. And because the 10 won over the two, the people 
were ready to kill Moses. I don't know if you remember this story. They were ready to kill Moses because how Moses, you, you let us into this. And God says, I'm now angry with the people. Guess what? You're not now, you're no longer going to go into the land. In fact, you're going to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness now because of what you did. You were going to go straight in. But now you're going to spend 40 years wandering in circles. And you remember the people at that point decided, okay, we're sorry. Now we're going to go straight in. And they got decimated by the people there because God says, I'm not with you. I was with you when you were obedient. When you disobeyed, I'm, that's not the plan any longer. Isn't this interesting? How many of you have thought about this in the Bible when God does this? That's not the plan anymore. Israel, you used to, you were going to drive out all the people. That's not the plan anymore in your land. So here's, here's what we need to know. Here's point number two, if you're taking notes. And this is a bit complex, I realized this morning. So sorry. God will always respond to true repentance with mercy. But some sin will completely alter your life. All right. That's just how it applies to us. All right. Are we talking about God conditionally deciding whether you get into heaven or not? Are we talking about God saying whether I see you as righteous or not? Is gonna, it's just depending on how well do you do? Let's get your report card out for your life. And let's decide now whether you get to come into the kingdom of heaven or not. No, that's not what we're talking about here. The grace of God is free. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter who you are. You coming to God with a true heart of repentance is him saying to you, I am, I'm going to my son's gift of dying on that cross and of his gift of righteousness for you is there for you. But here's the deal. Our sin still has consequences. I went to a men's retreat. Oh, this was shortly after I became a Christian. I was probably 19 years old, maybe 20 years old. And I went to a men's, ret men's retreat. And I remember a guy who was at that men's retreat who was giving his testimony. He was sharing his story about Jesus and his life up to that point. And I remember he, he told me that he used to be a firefighter and he used to be married and he said, I loved being a firefighter. That was my absolute, it was all I wanted to do from the time I was four years old was to be a firefighter. And at one point in his life, he was a firefighter. He had made it all the way through all the tests and gotten a, gotten a department and all those things. And he, he was married to a girl and they had two kids together. And one night he committed adultery on his wife while he was on the job. And he shared how in the aftermath of that, I don't know, six months, nine months later, he had repented of that sin. He had repented and, and was humbled and, and had asked the Lord for forgiveness for the sin of adultery. And I believe that he received that. I believe that he had forgiveness from the God of grace who pours out all grace on us when we go to him in repentance. But he was no longer a firefighter and he was no longer married. And the wife that he had loved at one point, his sweetheart that he had married was gone and the job that he had desired to do since he was four years old was never going to be an option again. Was he forgiven by God? Yes. Did sin completely alter his life from that point forward? Yes. This is true for those of you who have had a past before you became a Christian, isn't it? Those of you, you, you know. Man, my BC days, the way I lived, 
there are a lot of things from those days before we became Christians that carry over into our lives, even into our sanctified life as Christians. It carries over. Becoming a Christian means that God now views you with the righteousness of Jesus. There's no judgment upon you when you stand before him on judgment day. And yet the consequences of sin are not removed, are they? There are guys doing life sentences for murder across the street at Chino State Prison. Some of them have become believers. Guess what? They're still doing life sentences. Like there is no, there's no mechanism where God goes, you know what? You've come to me, repentance. I'm now going to let you out of prison. Why do I bring this up? Why do we talk? Why, why, why do we talk about it? First of all, we talk about this because this is what the text is saying. Verse three, if you ask me, what's at the core of our text this morning? It's God saying, I'm shifting the way I'm operating now with you. Your life now looks different because of this sin. And I want to create a category for us where, where life now looks different because of our sin. That first of all, there's a few, there's a few people I want to talk to in the moment. Number one, if you are currently living with the consequences of past sin, okay? So if you recognize already stuff has been done in the past, it's affecting me now in the future. Here's what I want to say to you. If you've repented of those sins, you've turned to the Lord to say, Lord, Lord, you know my frailty. Forgive me of that. That's in the past. It's, it's gone. It's in the past. Here's what, here's what you need to know this morning. The Lord has forgiven you. The grace is fully yours. You are not a second class citizen in the kingdom of heaven because of your past sins. It, the righteousness of Christ has covered it. God sees Jesus when he looks at you. Now, here's what you do. You learn how to live in full obedience to him, given the circumstances that you are in. That's hard because you might look around at other people that are living a different life than you are. They're living in a different situation and you have to keep looking back at that sin goes, gosh, I could have, it could have been different if I had gone a different way, way back then, woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? And you can get completely wrapped up in this idea of if only I had done something different back then and it can consume you. But that's not what God is calling you to do. What, is, what does it mean to be a faithful Israelite having heard God in Judges 2, 3 say, I'm no longer driving the people out? What does it mean to be faithful at that point? What did it mean in the book of Jeremiah, which some of you may not be aware of, where God says, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to take you away from Jerusalem back to his kingdom. And God says, this is my thing that I'm doing. What did it mean to be a faithful Israelite under Jeremiah? When Jeremiah was telling you these things. Did it mean take up arms and fight against the king of Babylon? No, Jeremiah specifically said, let him come in. I'm doing this. This is part of your disobedience. And these are the consequences of it. What does it mean to be a faithful Israelite living during Jeremiah's times? It's to recognize that what's done is done. And now I got to go be a Daniel, right? And you guys know the story. I got to go be a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I got to go from Jerusalem over to Babylon and live there under that king. And it may not have even been your sin or your disobedience. It might've been somebody else's sin 
and disobedience, which caused you to now live in the state that you live in. Anybody got parents? Anybody got parents that are sinners? Your life because of your parents. What are we going to do? What are you going to do about that? Well, if only they had, uh, 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 it, it's like, no, there's a faithfulness to the Lord that you now live given what you've, ex- what you've been given, given the lot in life that you have. And everybody in Judges from this point forward was experiencing a different lot in life than the people before them. Now live faithful. Now live faithful given what you've been given. And here's number two. Here's the second person I want to talk to this morning. If you have, if you have, if you are ever tempted to, so we're before the sin now, not after the sin, we're before the sin. If you are ever tempted to blatantly disobey God, Christians, if you are ever tempted to just blatantly disobey God, fear the Lord, first of all, fear him. Second of all, realize that that one sin may drastically alter your life, even if you repent of it. In other words, Christian, fear the consequences of sin. Fear the Lord who is over all first. But the book of Judges is showing us the consequences of sin. Fear that. That's okay to fear that. It's okay to look ahead and go, what would happen if I did X? What would be Y and Z that follow? So one of the things Judges does is it shows us the natural consequences of our sin. We get very few judgmental statements. We don't get, we don't get any judge statements of judgment upon the things that are going to happen in this book from this point forward. We really don't get a lot of them at all. All we get is a demonstration of this is what life looks like when we live this way. We see deeply broken lives and we see a deeply broken culture. And so we're to learn to fear the Lord from the book of Judges. We're to learn to hate sin and to hate its consequences. And that's true for Christians who have received the full grace of God upon their lives. You can make shipwreck of your faith, Christian. You can make a mess of your life, Christian. Don't do it. Let's pray. Ah, Lord, it's hard to stand up here and and speak these words, which are harsh words that come from, in, in my opinion, God, a harsh book. But God, I... I pray, first of all, that I would not stand up here in in some elevated position and speak as if those temptations would not be just around the corner for me as well. So God, all of us are in need, desperately in need of your sanctifying Holy Spirit, your restraining influence on our lives the power to overcome the temptation when the temptation comes to us to disobey you. And whether it's something that we think is small or something that we think is massive, God, sin is sin and it devastates and it destroys. So God, would you help us? And would you pour your grace out upon those right now that are all too conscious of their sin? They're all too aware of their past. And, and the temptation for them is to let the past just overwhelm them. Would you remind them of your free grace that one day we all who are in you are going to stand before you wearing white robes, symbolizing our righteousness that you've given us. And until that day comes, Lord, Lord would you help us to be, to be faithful and to live in light of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen a tough, tough sermon to talk about sin and the audience.
treasure and value so much. And that's represented that is behind you. The broken body of Jesus, the blood poured out of Jesus is that which offers and grants forgiveness for sinners. For those that are aware of something in your past where you say, man, if people really knew that about me, man, that would change their opinion. God says, come to me. Every single one of you come to the poor and the needy and the weak and the broken and those who have just been racked by sin. We already talked in our sermon today about Rahab, who was a prostitute, who was invited into the grace of God. She's an ancestor of Jesus Christ in his earthly lineage. So let this table represent for you Let it be something where God is offering his full forgiveness, not because of you, but because of the act that we are going to see demonstrated, the symbolic act we're going to see demonstrated here, right? As you hold that cracker, the broken body of Jesus, and you hold that juice, the blood of Jesus poured out. It was that that grants you your forgiveness, not your righteousness. So communion is for those who have put their trust in Jesus. If you have not put your trust in Jesus this morning, we just ask that you not get up, kindly not get up and and partake of communion. Uh, This is for those that have said yes to that gospel that I talked about earlier. It's also for those that 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 are demonstrating that trust through the obedience of being part of a faithful gospel preaching church. We don't say that Echo Church is the only faithful gospel preaching church. We say that there are other churches around that are faithfully preaching the gospel, but we believe it is obedience as a Christian to join up in some meaningful way with a church where you're known by that church. You are cared for by that church. That church knows your life to some extent. And so I want to speak against for a moment, the concept of being an individual Christian sort of wandering on your own. And I want to say, join a church and hold off on communion until you do. And so this is for those who have joined up with a church in some way. You may be joining us from another church. That's fine. If you're in, if you are in good standing at that church and you're in meaningful fellowship with them, then come to the table. If you're a member of Echo, come to the table. And so what we're going to do right now is go up and take the individual elements there, go back to your seat, and we'll take them together in just a few minutes. You guys can play some music. You guys can go, go on back. Let's hold the bread together and consider the death of Jesus for our sins. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Let's consider the death of Jesus through the cup. In the, de- in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together.
Lord Jesus, I pray that as we walk out from these doors, we would be appropriately fearful for the consequences of sin. And I just say appropriately this, that, that we would not allow a works-based mindset to come in to, to think in terms of how you view us in Christ, that, that we would recognize that Jesus paid all of our righteousness for all time if we're truly in him. And yet we still have choices that we make throughout our day. We still have a life to live. We still have a long period of time, we believe, until we, you either return, Lord, or until we go to be with you through death. And as, that, as we have that period of time, I pray, God, that we would use it faithfully, that we would redeem the time, as it says elsewhere in Scripture that we would not waste the time, that we would not find ourselves broken and beaten up when you return, but rather that we would be obedient to you no matter what the cost is. So we ask you, Lord, to now help us to be faithful as we walk out from these walls and help the world to see us in our faithfulness as Christians. And may we open our mouths to speak the gospel, the way in which you love your world is by sending us out into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Echo Church, thanks so much for being here this morning. Uh, just a reminder about going outside to share, uh, hang out with each other, fellowship. we got a few things out there for you. Um, and then we have another group coming in in just a few minutes. So God bless. Have a great Sunday. We will see you tonight for the Sunday evening service.